Good evening. Welcome to the Bridwell Institute's Texas Economic Forum. Tonight our, our topic is economic freedom and local economies. What does the research say? First of all, I want to give an introduction to those of you who aren't familiar with, with the Bridwell Institute. We are uh, established in 2020 by uh, alumnus Tucker Bridwell, and we are dedicated to discussing and researching the nature, consequences, and causes of economic freedom what impacts it has on, on outcomes, and, and, and what helps us to be freer. We were originally established, though, longer ago in 2008 as the O'Neill Center for Global Markets and Freedom, again, by another SMU, a generous SMU alum, William O'Neill, and that is where we started. We want to give a thanks to our major supporters, and those are listed here, of course, Tucker Bridwell, William O'Neill, the Full and Wider and Perot families and the Armitrout family and on and on. We've been uh, very generously blessed by the support of the uh, nonprofit community. So today, we're going to have a panel here. Hopefully, uh, Justin and Adam and Danielle, in, in order alphabetically, are going to, along with me, discuss why economic freedom matters, what it means for outcomes in the economy and in, in other situations as well. And the reason that we're all here is that about a year or two ago, we got a, a very generous grant from the Templeton World Charity Foundation for a project that we had entitled Metro Area Economic Freedom, expanding the research and bringing it to the public. So we commissioned 10 papers. Three of the authors are here with us tonight using a metropolitan area level economic freedom index that I'll get into in, in, in a little uh, detail here in a minute. Uh, most of those papers are going to then end up in a, a special issue of, of an academic journal that, that uh, my colleague Meg Tuzinski and I are co-editing, and uh, a couple of the others are already under, under uh, review at other journals, so hopefully we'll get all 10 of them out there, uh, pushed out into the academic research world. So today, before we get into uh, the, the great insights of our panelists about economic freedom and their specific research pro projects involved with this Templeton uh, Foundation grant, I want to tell a little story about essentially why we're here, why we measure economic freedom, why it matters. In my opinion, it starts with this guy, Adam Smith, the founding father of economics, and his most famous work is usually referred to as the Wealth of Nations. Well, I think the longer title really gives important context to what Smith was interested in and what, uh, what we at the Bridwell Institute are interested in. So Smith wondered why some countries were so rich and others were so poor. Well, this applies to states and cities as well, and we're going to narrow focus, narrowly focus in on, on local economies today, but, but these same issues apply across the board. Uh, Adam Smith uh, felt that government policy plays a role, and I tend to agree. He had what he called his system of natural liberty, which essentially assigned the legitimate functions of government to be the three listed there. Number one, basically protecting us from each other, so the police, the courts, prisons, things of that nature. Uh, number two, national defense, protecting us from people outside of our uh, boundaries. And then number three, certain what we often today call public goods, where I might part company with him a bit. But, but nevertheless, you know, this is a very slim, uh, slim vision of government that is, uh, is not, what we have, not what we have today. So in part, what, what, uh, what we're doing is that, uh, well, step back a minute. So, so in the Cold War, it was clear that the Soviet Union was putting out what now we, we think of maybe as propaganda, but as kind of dishonest data that made it seem like the West, right, the more free market world, was getting beaten economically by the centrally planned uh, Eastern Bloc. And so at some point, and, and my, uh, my boss, Bob Lawson, was there at the founding as well, but, but my favorite uh, economist, Milton Friedman, and a bunch of other policy scholars like, like Bob and, and his uh, a professor got together and said, you know, wouldn't it be nice if we had a way to measure this level of government intervention across these countries so we could statistically do some work to see whether this idea that centrally planned economies are better is really true. And so they met for a couple of years back and forth trying to agree on how to measure it because it is uh, not uh, something that's particularly uh, black and white. Um, but, but essentially, the, the, the goal is here, well, how closely does an economy or, or sorry, a governmental system meet Smith's system of natural liberty, a very slim government? And to the degree they don't, then we count that as economic freedom being low. So after a couple of years, in 1996, they, they got their first copy published, and 
it's been annual ever since. And so every year we get new numbers uh, ranking the, the, the freedom of the, the countries across the globe. This is the working definition they have. I like to think of it as simply the ability of us individuals to use our resources, time, money, whatever, in whatever way we wish as long as we're not hurting someone else. So to the degree to which government kind of interacts there and, and uh, restricts those choices, I think of that as, as imposition on economic freedom. So a couple years later, it occurred to them, or they just got around to it, and it said, so yes, these policy differences matter across countries, but they also matter within countries. And so they came up with a state level, or in Canada they call them provinces, the index of the, of the states of North America, and then eventually uh, we got the, the Mexican states involved as well. It was just Canada and the U.S. at first. But, so this was first published in 2002, and I got involved about 10 years ago maybe, and uh, the latest one it was our 18th. The, the data in these things has always got a little bit of a lag in it, so the one that came out in the fall was for 2020. So Adam Smith cared why some areas were more prosperous than others. Others care about that as well. It's an, it's an issue that's been debated by scholars since then, and, and there's no unanimous consensus uh, as to what the answer is. Uh, but there have been over 800 articles. That number is probably substantially low. Uh, using the, the country level index that, that Bob Lawson and Ryan Murphy work with here at Bridwell. And there have been uh, a smaller number, but a couple hundred also using the state level report that I got involved with a few years ago. And so this is an issue that people care about. And before I even got involved with the state level one, I had been working a lot with local data. So I said, well, I can do this, whatever they're doing with the states, just do that same thing to drill down to this uh, variety across areas within states, right? Sure, so California and Texas maybe are different, but areas within Texas, Dallas and Austin are different, right? Capturing those even finer level of, of distinctions of differences in policy across areas. And it gives us, instead of 50 states, we have 383 uh, MSAs to look at. So this has been through a couple iterations. The, the latest gets us through 2017. The, the data they collect is really just every five years, the Census Bureau goes out there and it sends a survey to every single government and to down to the narrowest uh, you know, small special district. And it takes them a while to get those back and to sort through them and, and get it all worked out. So, so the, the next, uh, we were through 2017, the next one will come out at the end of 2024. It uh, will allow us to update it a bit. But, but uh, the annual report there has kind of an article describing this as well as some of the, the data as well. And I'll have some of that here for you in a minute. Okay, so you might be thinking, what, how do we measure uh, economic freedom? What does it look like inside, like under the hood? So, so area one, we take the, the uh, total spending, the total budget, and divide it into three pieces. And for comparison across areas, we take whatever the dollar number is and divide it by, not by population, but by income to see what portion of the personal income for that area <coughs> goes towards this particular uh, budget item. And we just broke it into three categories, taxes, more or less the same approach. We'll take one for the income tax, one for the sales tax, and then one for everything else, which is mostly property taxes. And in both of these cases, we're looking at not just state level spending, but local as well. So it's the, the total uh, burden of state and local government, uh, wherever you happen to, uh, whatever MSA you choose to live in. And the last area three has a couple measures of labor market freedom. We look at the minimum wage and how much of a percentage that is of per capita income for, for better comparison across poor and rich areas. But, but basically we're trying to capture to what degree that, uh, that price floor is, uh, is valid, or sorry, is binding. Um, and then secondly, we look at to what degree the private sector has to compete with the public sector for employment. So we just take the government employment share, that's state and local, and, and divide it by the total employment there and then and then to capture try to capture uh, the impact of government union rules we just capture the the union density the percentage of the employment essentially that is employed in is a in a union each of those variables is scored zero to ten where ten is most free zero is is least free and then each of those within those three areas is weighted equally and each of those three areas is equally weighted so we get three area averages average those and Give us an overall score. Here's what it looks like map-wise. The color scheme is blue, most free, red, least free, and then in between it's kind of a stoplight, dark green, not so dark green, yellow, and then orange. And you see some similarities if I put this up next to the EFNA that ranks the states, right? It's the same color scheme. We have a few more colors on the left because there's so many areas, but, but uh, 
a, a lot of the, the differences across those areas uh, deal not only with local policy but with state policy as well. Finally, these are the uh, top 10 in the most recent version just to give you a feel for, for which areas had the highest. Uh, the, the Texas ones are bolded and then Dallas is in red. So, so three, of the, three of the big four, and this is just of the, the largest uh, metro areas, larger than a million. Three of those, the big four in Texas make the top 10. The bottom 10 is composed of California and New York, largely. And so these are areas where taxes are much higher, marginal tax rates are much higher, and spending levels are higher as well. And then last but not least, a list of the Texas MSAs. There's a bunch of them, 25 of them. And so if you throw all of the bigger and smaller ones together, Dallas falls a little bit. Uh, Midland is though up there at fourth, and, and Tyler at Dallas, uh, and then San Angelo. And, and you'll see that uh, San Antonio is not until the second page, where it's still fairly high up there. But, but also if you look at the scores, you've got the lowest in Texas is a 6.67. This is remember a zero to ten scale, and the highest is eight point six months. That's a fairly big uh, that's a fairly big difference between the two, about uh, thirty percent or so uh, more free in Midland than in Laredo. And last but not least, we have a couple of figures taken from the, that annual report article I mentioned. And on each of these, you've got most free on the right, left, and then gradually working towards least free on the right. Each of them are scored by that most recent freedom score. The uh, upper left shows the growth of income from this. So it's a 2017 economic freedom, it's 2017 to 19 growth in personal income, employment, population. And then this is the, this is the current unemployment rate at 2017, where you see, because that's a bad, right? Higher or bad, that's, uh, you see the opposite pattern. But in all of these, and if you look especially at the, the population growth, you see that expected trend. But here it's like 200, uh, 200 times higher growth, which I know is hard to wrap your head around, but, but in population. So, and a lot of what you're seeing there is, is population migration. So this is a, on the right, a picture of the uh, population change just in, in the last year. And you see how the bluest, where well, those are the ones that got the most inbound migration, kind of match up. Uh, lucky we had chosen blue over here with the blue over here. And the orange-ish, uh, which are the, the most outbound migration match up pretty well with the, the red over here. It's just a cor correlation, not causation, but it's, uh, it's still, I think, noteworthy. What I want to do next is turn things over to my esteemed colleagues. I'll have a, a question for each of them individually about their, their research project with the, the Templeton Grant, and then we'll open up for, for Q&A to, to, to you guys. Um, so I'm going to go alphabetically here. Justin. Okay, Justin. Some people assume that economic freedom only helps the wealthy. You've done some research that shows otherwise. Why don't you tell us about it? Um, so yeah, so I've done a little bit of work on this kind of inequality question because it's like, all right, well, economic freedom, pretty much everyone agrees is good for incomes. It's you know, positively related to incomes, employment, all these sorts of things that we like. Um, but some of the concerns are, okay, well, is it just really helping the richest people? Are really only the richest people gaining from it? And some of the work I've done has, has shown that um, incomes across all income distributions are going up with respect to economic freedom. So when economic freedom or places become economically free, it's not just that the rich are getting richer and the poor are getting poorer, it's that everyone's getting richer. Um, but not only that, and I think something that might be even more important is not just that everyone's incomes are going up, but it also allows people to move across the distribution. So just because the position that you're put in in life to start with is necessarily constricted um, in economically free places. You have a better opportunity to not just um, improve your own life, but improve relative to others. Um, so both you know, have an absolute gain in income, but also a relative gain. If you're at the bottom of the income distribution, you're more likely to work your way up and uh, have a better livelihood. Very good, very good. And I inadvertently gave you the question instead of asking for your paper summary, so oh. my bad. But uh, why don't you go ahead and uh, summarize the paper for the Templeton Grant, or was that included? Oh, this that was a different Yeah, paper, it was a different but, question. Okay. Yeah. Oh, do you want me to go to the podium or sit here? Or? Yeah, you can come here if you want. Oh, okay. sure. Sweet. Okay. So, yeah, so, well, thank you uh, for the invite. I'm really excited to be here. I always love uh, coming to Dallas, so... Uh, 
I went to you know a school not here for grad school, so I won't, I won't name names, but somewhere in in Texas, um, in a not as fun city as Dallas. So always good, always good to be here. Um, so yeah, so a little bit of the work that I've done has been on economic freedom and specifically its impact on in, uh, income and employment, specifically during the Great Recession. So obviously, I don't need to tell everyone here that the Great Recession was not was not great for people, right? It wasn't necessarily uh, by any stretch of the imagination a good thing. Um, you know, uh, unemployment roughly doubled during that time. Uh, GDP throughout the country dropped like four to five percentage points. So it was a really, you know, a terrible situation. It was prolonged compared to previous recessions. It was, you know, other than the Great Depression, it was, it was one of the, it was probably the worst economic crisis that the country's had, at least in modern time. Um, but that recession was different amongst uh, areas too. So a lot of areas, you know, had this sort of recessionary period that existed for more than one, you know, one year, one and a half years, two years, while some areas, specifically like Austin, San Antonio, even Dallas, the recession really only lasted um, a year, sometimes even less than that. So the, the impact that it occurred in different areas w was, you know, different. And one of the questions I wanted to ask was, okay, well, why is that? Does economic freedom have any role in explaining that? And, the, you know, thinking, okay, well, yeah, everyone pretty much agrees that economic freedom is good for incomes and employments during normal times, but, you know, when, when things go poorly, when there's a crisis, that's, you know, that's when the government's supposed to come in and help. And we wanted to kind of question that and see, like, all right, well, does that actually bear fruit? Does that actually end up working out? Um, the idea is that economic freedom provides flexibility. So like Dean's mentioned, right, it allows people to kind of troubleshoot on their own, you know, try to figure out different ways rather than one centrally um, planned way in which to solve different crises. So what we uh, end up finding is that places that were economically free, metropolitan areas that were economically free, um, had higher incomes, had lower unemployment rates, both during kind of a normal time, but also specifically during the Great Recession, uh, which I think is, is interesting because, again, that's kind of the time that you would most expect or most, you know, most people would say, like, all right, that's the time when government needs to come in. But even in those cases, economic freedom can allow for other areas to, um, you know, to, to improve and, and, you know, get hit, you know, everyone was hit hard, but get hit, you know, relatively uh, less hard. Um, one thing that kind of came out pretty interesting out of that was not only that economically free places fared better during the recession, but also places that were becoming economically free going into the Great Recession. So those who were putting in uh, market liberalization policies in the, you know, five, ten years before also be, you know, benefited even to a greater extent. So that sort of momentum of, all right, well, you know, the economic freedom, the way it's measured, you know, might not be able to capture everything that we want to think about, but it kind of gave a good proxy of, all right, well, if you're, you know, the area has this sort of momentum going into the uh, Great Recession, they, they tended to fare even better uh, during the Great Recession period. Obviously, they didn't improve, relative, you know, absolute terms, but they uh, didn't, they weren't harmed as, as badly as other places that didn't have that sort of momentum towards uh, economic freedom. And that kind of leads to, you know, something that we uh, kind of looked at uh, as well, which is industry concentration. And one of the reasons I care about industry concentration is because I both work and am from Louisiana, which is very, you know, um, reliant on, on oil, um, one might say, which, you know, both, and I, it actually works out well that I'm here because, you know, we're in Texas. And both, you know, Louisiana and Texas are two of the biggest oil producing states in the country. However, you know, when there's the oil crash, right, both places get hit, but Louisiana suffers really poorly. And the general idea is, well, because that's kind of their, they're kind of their, their, their only thing. Like there's, you know, there's oil and there's tourism if you want to go have a fun time in New Orleans. And that's, you know, it's pretty much it. While in Texas, right, there's a lot of other opportunities. You see, you know, large firms. Uh, large firms are doing so a lot of innovation coming and starting to move to Texas, while Louisiana doesn't really have that. If anything, people are, are leaving and moving elsewhere. So I kind of wanted to see, like, all right, well, how does economic freedom play into that? Because I kind of can think of it anecdotally, but I wanted to see how does it bear out. And again, it kind of shows that if you're economically free, right, you allow for more opportunities, not just, you know, for, you know, individuals, but also, like, more opportunities to try different industries, right? You're not necessarily stuck on being in the one specific industry that, you know, you might just be most well known for. Um, which also kind of ties in back to the Great Recession point, which is during these recessions, concentrated areas are, hurt really, are hit really hard, right? You can think about for COVID, for example. Well, 
if one of the reasons to go to New Orleans is for tourism, well, when COVID, when no one was traveling or visiting, there was no really, re you know, not much of a reason to go to New Orleans anymore. Restaurants were closed, bars were closed, event spaces. Um, so that, you know, there wasn't really much reason to go, so they were hit especially hard. You know, but a place like maybe Austin, where, you know, people also go to visit and have fun and have a good time, wasn't as hit as hard from these, you know, a different crisis, but still a crisis nevertheless, um, because there were other alternatives. There were other opportunities that they could thrive on that wasn't necessarily just related on one specific uh, point. Um, so, yeah, so that was a kind of summary of, of what I want to talk about. But, yeah, happy to answer any questions uh, later, later in the Q&A. Yeah, thank you. All right, very good. Adam, next. Good evening. Uh, my name is Adam Hoffer. I work for the Tax Foundation, and uh, I'm an affiliated scholar with the Free Market Center at Concordia University in Wisconsin. For my research paper as part of this project, one question that was on my mind was how this measure of economic freedom affected housing. Uh, housing is a really, really important sector and part of our economy, and the housing markets were in part, if not entirely, responsible for the Great Recession that we just heard about. Uh, housing's really important. So I wanted to explore how housing interacted with economic freedom. Uh, I've done my best to put an entire academic paper on one slide. <clears throat> it tells a lot of the story. I'll try to explain it uh, without too many uh, fancy numbers, stars, or pictures. But let me go through uh, what our thought process was and then explain to you what we found. So when it comes to housing, uh, the typical economist uh, doing this research project, uh, we love to separate housing into the two main factors that we love to study in economics, demand and supply. On the demand side, the story has already been told for us with other research projects. Uh, Dr. Stanzel mentioned over 800 published academic studies in economics that explore economic freedom. They tell a consistent story over and over again. Where there's more economic freedom, there is more income, there's more migration, there's more, really, all of the good stuff we think about in economics. When we translate that to housing, it means more economic freedom, more demand for housing. The question that we try to tackle in this paper is, well, what does it do for supply? And what do those two effects have to tell us about the price of housing? So uh, <clears throat> what we found, we looked at repeat housing sales for about two decades in most large metropolitan areas across the US, matched that up with the economic freedom scores that Dr. Stanzel and other researchers uh, provided us. And what we found, is that in parts of the country with better economic freedom, higher levels of economic freedom, we saw more housing being built. Again, now part of this we would expect if more people are going to those places, they need somewhere to live, right? But that's not always the case, right? You can think about uh, certain cities across the country where uh, people wanna live and they're not building a lot of housing, right? So what we found is that for areas with higher economic freedom, hires with more economic freedom, we saw more housing being built. What that translates into numerically is that one unit of economic freedom on this one to 10 scale translates into somewhere between 850 and a little over a thousand extra units of housing built per year. So that one unit of economic freedom, I will say, is, is a big change. That's a really big change. That's the difference between most Texas cities and most Louisiana cities. That's not a small change, that's a big change. <clears throat> But 1,000 units per city per year is also a big number. That's an important number. Uh, when we look at the value of that construction, those you know, roughly 1,000 units turn into uh, about $236 million worth of real estate built per year, where we have higher levels of economic freedom. We also see... Uh, over time, across about two decades that we study this, higher growth rates of housing construction and higher growth rates in that value being built. So uh, if we had any 
Uh, students in here, uh, if, if this were my classroom, I would quiz you what would happen uh, if we have increased demand, right? More people moving to an area. And now we have more supply being built. What would we think would be the effect on price? It's a trick question because we don't know, right? More demand and more supply means we get more of something, but we don't quite know what that means for price. So that's a great job for an empirical economist. We plugged in some housing price data and we tried to figure that out. This is what we found. So we found where we see higher levels of economic freedom, we see higher housing prices, right? Now, when I talk about price, this is a little bit different than when we talk about most economic measures. Right? When we think about sort of tradi traditional economic measures, uh, income, economic growth, these have a simple story. More is better, right? More income is better than less income. More growth is better than less growth. Price is not quite the same, right? Price is like a tool. You can't just say a bigger wrench is better than a smaller wrench. You want the right size wrench for the job, right? So price is a tool. Higher prices are not necessarily better than worse prices, right? When we think about housing prices across the country, we can see at the opposite ends of the spectrum, there are real problems, right? If housing prices become so high that most people in the area can't afford a house, that's a problem. If housing prices plummet and fall, like we saw in Detroit, people don't want to maintain the house, we get urban blight, also a problem, right? So again, higher prices is not necessarily a good thing uh, unless you own real estate, then it feels great, right? Uh, the other thing that we found is that uh, areas with higher levels of economic freedom saw slower housing price growth. So the story that we found when exploring the relationship between housing prices, or between housing and economic freedom, is that areas with more economic freedom are able to build more houses to support the people that are moving there. The result is you get higher levels of demands. The net effect is higher prices, higher real estate values and prices in those areas, but they grow at a slower, more sustainable rate. Uh, this has been a really fun project to work on. I appreciate your time. If you have any questions, feel free to uh, ask them later as we'll have a little bit more of a discussion. Thank you. Great, thank you, Alan. Okay, next up, Danielle. Perfect. Hello, okay, perfect. Um, so I'm Danielle Zanzalari. I um, am at Seton Hall in New Jersey also not very economically free relative to Texas, but I lived here for four years prior um, and got to know the SMU uh, individuals and Bridwell Institute individuals quite well. Um, and I'm, I am very fond of Texas and their um, tacos. <laughs> because we, but we have a lot better Italian food in New Jersey and, and, and that's, we could debate about that after, but I, yeah. Okay, so my research uh, project here was looking at partisan affiliations and whether um, electing a Republican-controlled state legislator, legislature, excuse me, or a Democratic-controlled legislature led to more economic freedom. So we used a quasi-random experiment, which means that we looked at close elections, so areas where it could have gone either way, uh, electing a more Democratic uh, state legislature or a Republican state legislature. We chose to look at the state lower house, the house of... Um, representatives typically in a state government because they are the body that actually proposes legislation. So they're the ones that actually put kind of what's on the docket for uh, the state government in any session. And so we kind of have four main results and that's what I'm going to kind of cover today. Um, the first main result is that if you are in one of these areas that has a close election and you elect a Republican state legislature, it leads to more economic freedom but it's only when there's a unified government, and that means that the governor is also a Republican. So this, uh, this makes sense in the sense that if you elected a Republican state legislature uh, and a Democrat governor's there with you know, some veto power, you might actually not be able to move the legislation that was proposed. Um, but for places that are unified, where they get a Republican state legislature and a Republican governor, you do get more economic freedom. And from what Dean showed earlier, um, the different types of 
uh, components underneath economic freedom. There's taxation, spending, and labor market uh, policies. Primarily what's changed when you elect a Republican legislature um, and a Republican governor is through labor market policy. So you, the, what's becoming more free is uh, through labor market policy, which is the minimum wage laws, um, union density, and uh, how many government employees there are relative to the private employee population. The second result that we found, um, so the yeah, second result that we found was over time, when you look at, so the second result is labor market policy, sorry, the third result is over time, when you move from the 1970s, 80s to, to present, as this data is from the 1972 to 2017, that there is a greater impact of electing a Republican state legislature um, and having a Republican governor on economic freedom. So um, over time, as you elect um, a more Republican and uh, state legislature and, gover and governor, it could lead to more economic freedom over time. We don't really explore the reasons why, but some of the literature suggests that there's two reasons. There's increased polarization of politics lately, and so um, each respective political party is gonna you know, cater more to their base much stronger now than possibly in the 70s or 80s. Um, a second one is that people are so, so more polarized so they're voting straight party tickets, so you're getting more unified governments, which can lead to more uh, policies that are more aligned with the party. The fourth um, major result here that we found is also looking at mayors. So we looked at mayor um, close elections around the country for MSAs, and we found that um, electing a Republican mayor actually leads to even more economic freedom impact than if you elected a Republican state legislature. So um, mayors can have um, more impact on economic freedom than possibly state legislatures. When we tried to break that down to the components, like is it coming from the taxation side? Is the taxation more favorable at um, you know, the MSA level or spending or labor policy? We don't get any statistical power because we have a little bit of sparse data at the mayoral level. But there's some really good work from a researcher um, at Harvard that's coming out with a huge election, local election data set that should be coming out this year. And so we can explore that a little bit more with this. So kind of in conclusion with what our research shows is that if you are a decisive voter, so you're in an area where there's close elections and you can kind of choose um, of, of whom to elect, if you desire more economic freedom, you can get that with a Republican state legislature. If you prefer um, a less economically free area because what the index shows, you prefer more taxation, um, spending, and labor policy, which I know might seem silly, but you might want those government services that come with that possibly, um, then you, you actually can have that impact as well. So that there is, you do as a voter have impact on economic freedom. Um, the last conclusion is, as Dean was showing you the, um, the economic freedom scores of Texas and how they varied from DFW through um, Laredo, I was looking at Odessa. And so the difference between Dallas and Odessa, Texas, is about one, uh, uh, is exactly one in our data um, over time. So that means that Dallas scores one point higher, they're one point higher economically free than Odessa. Um, that's a big jump. So if you really want to be in an area with more economic freedom, it might be actually conducive to move. Whereas what we found in our data by just electing like a Republican legislature, it only leads to 0.167 more economic freedom. So basically moving, you can increase your economic freedom six times more than just doing it through the power of um, electing someone. Um, at the mayoral level, it's 0.32. So you can get a much bigger influence at the mayoral level, but actually moving is likely the best way to increase economic freedom. And that's kind of where our research is gonna go um, and explore that more, whether it actually makes sense to move. We know moving is costly, it's, it's, it's not costless, whether it makes sense to kind of move that from um, you know, a life perspective, but that's, that's further research. So again, thanks for having me. Thanks, Dean. Thank you, Danielle, that was great. So, so we've got uh, questions for, uh, got one for Justin already. Well, we've got a question for Adam, a question for Danielle, and then we'll open it up to Q&A to, to the rest of you. Uh, so Adam, as everyone in this room knows, property taxes in Texas are quite high. Uh, now, now in part, that's the price of having no income tax, but, but we also have a pretty high sales tax. So, 
So uh, here's a, I got a two part question for you. Uh, what's your opinion of say reducing property taxes in exchange for an increase in excise taxes on things like gasoline, tobacco, and alcohol? Are there any other sources of, of excise tax revenue that could alleviate some of the property tax burden if you could if you could get people to agree to switch them? Yeah, uh, thanks, Dean. Sure. Um, in my, I, I spent a lot of time studying excise taxes outside of housing. Uh, I, I really enjoy studying uh, tobacco, alcohol, marijuana, gambling. It's a really fun job. Um, <laughs> th this is, uh, I've actually been asked by uh, many Texas journalists uh, about property taxes this year. I know it's a, a big issue for the state. Um, so the, the first question, how do we compare, you know, what would the effects be for uh, trying to lower property taxes by increasing uh, the sort of more narrow tax bases on cigarettes, alcohol, uh, gaming, or gas? Uh, I'll, I'll try to go through those each systematically um, kind of quickly. So gas taxes mostly fund roads. I think the gas tax should be enough to fund roads, and then we can end the story there. Uh, if you need more money for roads, Maybe you raise the gas tax or uh, transition to something like a vehicle mile travel tax, but uh, we'll, we'll end the gas tax discussion there. Uh, cigarettes and alcohol each have their own. They're each a, a vice to their own regard. Um, it would be really difficult to fund a statewide property tax uh, decrease through marginal increases to alcohol or cigarettes. So um, I don't think those are great ways to go. What, what I have really been enjoying discussing uh, which I think makes a, some Texas legislature, or legislators squirm a little bit, are uh, new excise taxes that we've seen in other states but uh, might not have come uh, heavily to Texas yet. Uh, and those are online sports gambling and marijuana taxes. Uh, the markets there are rather large. Uh, the potential markets in Texas uh, we estimate to be about uh, up to $400 million a year for marijuana and about $100 million a year for more legalized, regulated online sports wagering. Uh, so that comes out to, again, depending if you do one or both of those, uh, a couple hundred dollars per year for every property owner. Uh, so if, if you want to find a way to lower uh, property taxes through uh, switching to excise taxes, bringing some of these new markets online uh, is a creative way of maybe doing that. Very good. Makes sense. Okay, uh, Danielle, before you got into academia, you worked at the Fed and at a very large bank. Uh, what insights do those uh, experiences give you about the importance of economic freedom? Okay, so one of the reasons I was drawn to being like a financial economist and in the banking sector, I know this is a little bit more on politics and taxation, my research here, um, is because the roles that banks have in society as being an intermediary and and really helping investment, private investment. So one of the neat things about working at a bank, at, at both the central bank and a, and a very large private bank, um, is is how much regulation actually exists, and, and what 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 they what they try to do to in efforts to try to economically grow, but they're not doing that with regulation. So one of the reasons when, for example, when I was at the Fed, they always find new ways to try to regulate banks and there's less discussion on how to eliminate some of those regulations. Some regulations might lead to a more efficient outcome, but a lot of them do not lead to more efficient outcomes. And then when I moved to Texas, one of the first jobs I had here was actually at Citigroup, I don't mind saying it, um, which I loved working there. But um, the burden of all that regulation was really apparent by how many people we hired to comply with regulation. And I was kind of on both sides of that, both being a Fed economist and um, a Citigroup economist. And it, was, it, 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 was, it, it seemed more for appearances than actual real help to society, what it was doing. And a lot of the things that I was working on was kind of post the Great Recession, all the regulation that came out in the Great Recession. Um, you know, they're still doing stress testing. We're in 2023. 20, this is 13 years after the Great Recession. Um, they're still stressing assets. They're going through these billion, billion dollar exercises um, every year, and they don't really fail banks, and, and it becomes a little bit performative. So um, I guess to answer your question, um, I think banks have a really good role. I think they should be, the central bank and banks should be focusing on trying to lessen regulation um, to lead to more efficiency and more economic freedom. 
Awesome. Very good. Thank you. Um, so <coughs> what we're going to do next is I have several questions I want to ask, but I'm going to go ahead and open it up to you guys. Uh, and uh, if, if none of you want to ask questions, I've got plenty. But uh, it, we have a mic on each side, so just come on down and, and feel free to ask about the papers or, or any other issues that, that have been discussed tonight. Hi. On the, on the income inequality uh, portion of your discussion, I've recently been reading that book by uh, Phil Graham and Bob Eklund, and I think it's John Early, which is, I think the title is something like, um, the, uh, it's challenging the, the, uh, the myth of income in inequality. Are you familiar with the, the work? Or? I'm familiar with it, but I haven't okay. read it. And yet. there was a Wall Street Journal article that they had a couple of weeks ago. Anyway, what they do is they look at income inequality, which is basically done on census data. They look at income, and, and the typical study is you look at the bottom. The, you do it in quintiles. So you've got the top 20% and 20% and and increments. And the, the normal version of this among the mainstream press is that the income of the top quintile is 16 times the bottom. And what they do in the book is go in and look at, well, what's actually included as income when you're ma doing these measurements? And what they find is that income does not include something like two-thirds of the transfer payments. It also is not done net of taxes. So if you take into account the, uh, the transfer payments and you take into account taxes, the difference between the bottom and the top is 4 to 1 rather than 16 to 1. Whether you think 4 to 1 is good or 16 to 1 is good, you know, there are all kinds of different people can have different opinions about it, but what you at least ought to be have agreement as to what income is and what these ratios are and what the numbers are. And I guess my question is, does that have any impact? Does your numbers, I assume, are done on just sort of standard census data. Any reason to think that it would be meaningfully changed, whether you did better numbers were adjusting for transfer payments and adjusting for taxes? Yeah, so I, th I think that's a very, you know, very interesting question. That I wasn't familiar with that. Um, so that's kind of what I want to do next is at the state and local level, specifically for the income inequality. So all the Great Recession stuff that I discussed was amongst uh, metropolitan areas, but the inequality and mobility stuff was across countries. Um, so I, I hope we don't have that type of, pro I think that, yeah, that data was kind of taking into account all sorts of income. Um, but yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, inclu yeah, including, yeah, transfers, um, household income, all the, all sources of revenue that would come in to a house. Um, so, but that'll be definitely something, to thank, thank you for bringing it up, because it's going to be something I'll need to look into if, when I do it eventually on the state level. So, thank you. Uh, I had a question regarding housing pricing, prices and economic freedom. Um, you seem to mention that the prices tend to increase where there's more economic economic freedom, but did your paper delve into any reasons why this might be? Like maybe is the price per, per square foot any different? Or like maybe people in more economic free areas have higher real incomes and so they prefer larger houses or anything like that? So we didn't dive into the specific components of, you know, is it more driven by population change or income growth or uh, some other facet of the area? We were, I mean, the effect is entirely driven by demand. In fact, uh, because there's more supply growth, it's even more driven by demand, right? So um, we don't have a, a separation of, you know, how much, is it, how much of it is because it's income growth or population growth. Um, we've done separate studies where we show, I mean, pretty clearly uh, as causally as we can with, with this kind of data that uh, migration growth comes as well. Um, but it seems to be largely driven by it's uh, all those economic forces coming together. So the uh, income growth with the job growth uh, also makes people you know, willing to pay more for housing. Okay. Thanks. Thanks. Adam, I'm going to ask a quick question, just maybe a challenge uh, on the, so one point of economic freedom is a big deal. And then you said a thousand houses is a big deal. That doesn't sound like a lot of houses in Dallas. I just checked the internet. It's DFW had 50,000 housing starts last year and 60,000 the year before. So it was down. Now, I suppose in Dayton, Ohio, a thousand is a big number. So I guess the question is, is there a way to to frame that number like, like I'm thinking like an elasticity or something, you know, something that, that gives you a sense of the scale because, you know, that, that's, that's big in some places, but it's not terribly big here. I don't know if your metrics allow you to do that, but if there's a way to 
Right. I mean, we, so we could, but it would be an elasticity with, with economic freedom. How to do that either. So that's, right. that's, <laughs> it's yeah. almost uninterpretable. But I mean, you're, so you're, <laughs> you're, your point is well taken. Uh, I like the, the uh, $236 million sounds nicer. But again, when, you, when it goes to the scale of housing, right, it's, um, it's still a relatively small number. Um, I do think that a marginal effect of a thousand houses a year is a lot. Um, a thousand units every year compounds quickly over time, and so uh, I think that uh, you know, for me, it's it's the kind of thing that also, if you say like, you know, a one percent difference in economic growth is small, you're a hundred percent correct. A one percent change in income over time, uh, or a one percent change in income each year is small, but you compound that over 50 years and it looks a lot different over time. That's the best answer I have for you. Uh, Adam, you touched on this, but for all of you, what's the relationship between, of course, economic freedom and the overall cost of living as far as, you know, given the number one issue these days being inflation? So I guess we don't have a, um, we don't expand to the full cost of living measure, but housing's the biggest component in the bundle that we use to measure <clears throat> cost of living. Um, and so, right, our results would, I, would imply that, uh, again, housing prices are higher, so cost of living would be higher in more economically free areas, but that that grows at a slower rate over time mostly because they're able to, to build more housing. Um, so uh, I look at this as the, the story from that is that uh, more economically free areas are uh, better reacting to the changing demographics, population and migration change over time. Um, but I don't have a, a direct apples to apples answer for you on total cost of living measure. One, one way you can think about this issue is that one of the components of the index is the minimum wage. And so in an area where the minimum wage is higher, they'll the, have a lower economic freedom score. And, and in those places, the, co the labor costs for, um, uh, especially the, the restaurant industry, a lot of the service industry will be higher by the amount of that increase in the minimum wage. And so you could say that, well, yeah, here's a way, a channel through which these economic freedom indexes can be impacting cost of living and one of them is the the, the labor costs for for the largely the food service industry okay so the the research i didn't dive into it in great detail but the research using these indexes is focused on a whole variety of items not just gdp or gdp growth uh some research recently that that you've done justin looks at economic freedom and health outcomes what, what did you find in that paper yes yeah, so still I think, a working paper yes yeah, so that one's still working so you know you know kind of see how it goes but at least the preliminary results kind of look at and one of the reasons kind of give a little bit of a backstory of why looking into it like why you know why consider it is Part of that, okay, well, yeah, income, more income, you know, like you mentioned, more income is better than less. Um, but does it, you know, give you a more fruitful, like, like a, I guess, like broadly considered standard of living, like broadly considered a happy life, if you want to call it that, in its simple terms. So, you know, the way to measure happiness might not, might be a little vague and, and hard to um, actually go with. So, you know, we're going to try a few different things, and one of them is, is health. And we find that people's, Physical and mental health is higher in um, economic, in more economically free areas. The reasons for this is probably driven largely by uh, kind of a pass-through income of well, one of the main reasons. For example, one of the main reasons that people get divorced is money. One of the main reasons that people um, struggle with mental health or physical health is lack of access to healthy food or the mental health health resources that they need. So if you're in an economically free place, you're probably going to have higher incomes than if you didn't. Um, and then now that gives you more broader opportunity set of things to kind of help with your mental and physical uh, health. Very good, very good. Um, so Danielle, before you recently uh, moved to New Jersey a while back, you, you lived right here in Dallas. Um, so you've lived in, in an area with high economic freedom and one with uh, pretty low economic fr freedom. What are some things in New Jersey that, that they kind of get wrong that make it less free? Uh, quite a few. Um, <laughs> I'm from New Jersey, full disclosure. I'm very clearly pregnant, so I moved up to be near family, but I absolutely love Texas and 
you know, foreseeing myself coming back at some point. But, um, well, first off is not only do we have high property tax, but we also have high income tax. So that's that uh, we have the highest property tax in the country that is um, number one every year. We don't have the highest income tax. Uh, California does beat New Jersey, but we're, we're really close. Um, and we have a sales tax too. Um, so just purely on the taxation policy, that's one of the ways. Um, I do some work for, public, uh, for New Jersey public policy, uh, nonpartisan institutes to try to push along policies that could just make us marginally more economically free. For example, um, in New Jersey, there's an inheritance tax. So um, only about five states around the country have an inheritance tax. So many of you are aware that there's an estate tax, the federal level, over $11 million, 11 point something, you are taxed. Uh, but you could give your, you know, when you die, you could give $11 million to your children or whomever, and, you're, and that's fine. Well, in New Jersey, if you don't have children or you want to give it to your sister, say, your children died, you don't have children, or you want to give it to your niece, you're taxed 15% of whatever you have. And so you're seeing that actually like retirees and people who might have started businesses and want to keep them are selling them and moving to places like Texas and Florida. Um, and so it seems like such a simple tax. It doesn't actually raise a ton of money for New Jersey, but it's, it's distortionary and it changes uh, where people actually want to live. And so even some, something so small as a 15% tax, but it's 15% tax when lots of other states don't have it, including states surrounding New Jersey like Pennsylvania. Um, the economic freedom of Pennsylvania off the top of my head is much more free than New Jersey, even though they are both uh, worse than Texas in terms of the ranking scale. And so um, it's, it's policies like that that make you shake your head like, who thought this was a really good idea? Um, and I always try to approach them from an economic side, a data side, why this is not leading to more entrepreneurs, leading to uh, a larger retiree base being there um, and attracting new business too. Good, very good. Um, Adam, I know you've done a lot with excise taxes. I saw something from Tax Foundation just uh, today or yesterday on uh, a looming threat to economic freedom with new excise taxes on streaming services. Is this real? It's, I don't think we have that here yet, but is this... Is, Some this good and, is, this, is this real and is it a good thing? Yeah, opinion? I will say uh, we usually think of innovation as a wonderful thing. Uh, governments tend to be really innovative in finding new things to tax. And then they spread like wildfire. Uh, the, the favorite example that I like to give was uh, uh, Los Angeles got so tired of, of losing to Michael Jordan and the Bulls that they created a, a standalone one-off tax that... Uh, any worker who uh, worked in California, even if it was only one day a year, uh, and they earned over a million dollars, had to pay income tax to the state of California. Um, what followed the next year was the state of Illinois passed a law that any workers from Los Angeles who worked in Illinois had to pay income based on how long they worked in Illinois. And before long, most states in the country have this rolling law of if you work there, uh, even if it's only a day or two a year, uh, they have to pay state income taxes if the state has an income tax. Uh, I would, man, I can't even imagine trying to do an entertainer's income tax return. That would be miserable. Uh, digital service taxes, yes. Uh, states have recognized that all over the country we consume Netflix and all sorts of streaming services. Uh, these tend to have hubs in very tech-heavy areas, California, uh, Austin, certain parts of the country. Um, and they're looking for ways to, to get their hands on some tax revenue. So uh, the short answer is that these proposals have crept up in many state legislatures across the country. Uh, generally speaking, they're just, they're just not a great tax idea. It's a super narrow base, distorts incentives, um, but... Uh, we'll, we'll see what comes through the state legislators, uh, through the legislative sessions this year. Very good, very good. I, I have one question for all three of you. Um, you're all college professors or have been recently, and I wonder what, why it is you think that, and we got some students in the room, but we've got some good students from our reading groups, but why do you think that these ideas that, that Adam Smith talked about and that we're trying to measure with these indexes. Why do you think these ideas are so seemingly unpopular with, uh, with today's college students? I'm the most recent, so I'll go last. <laughs> I have the least experience with it. Oh, you're going to make me go first. Oh, I, I see how that works. Um, wow. I, 
I don't know if I have a great answer to this question. I think that, um, man, that's a tough question, Dean. Uh, why are some ideas more popular than others in this space? Um, answer for Go, please, because sure. I, I don't have a good one teed up. <laughs> my, my prevailing thought typically is um, that they don't understand economics. So they don't actually understand the real effect of said policy or said proposal on the economy. Um, one, of the, one of my favorite uh, groups of people to teach are the principal students that come in freshmen um, at Seton Hall, uh, Economics Council of Social Science. So I get nurses, I get educators, I get non-business students as well as business students. And that's actually a really great opportunity, I think, to get economics out to people who otherwise might not be exposed to ideas of economic freedom, entrepreneurship, business growth, income growth. Um, and so I, I find that once in the class they say, oh, like those price gouging laws, well that's politically popular, but it makes no efficient sense. You know, in a tornado or a hurricane, demand rises, supply falls, prices have to go up. Just a natural demand and supply model. And um, you know, uh, until they see that, they just think that businesses are being mean and greedy and they don't actually make that connection. So I feel like more economic education, which, uh, here, here's a plug for you, with, with, <laughs> which is what you guys are doing at the Birdwell Institute in Texas and the education and how you're getting it to middle school and high school students is fantastic. And, and it's a program I'm a part of too, so I think it's, I think it's great. Absolutely. Our uh, Teaching Free Enterprise program has been around for quite some time, and, and, and I believe maybe all of you are, are involved in that in some, uh, some way, or at least a couple of you. And, and we go out and we give these seminars, mostly in the summer when teachers are, are off, uh, about how to teach free enterprise economics, because in Texas, students are required to have uh, a semester, I believe it is, of free enterprise economics just to graduate high school. And, and we're, we're providing a service of helping them teach that, that stuff better, Ho hopefully, that's the goal at least. But anyhow, that was uh, an aside, I suppose. Um, anyone else on why? Yeah, well, got, uh, you know, I, will, I will keep going on the education front. Um, I do think that as a lifelong educator, especially when I entered the, the field of being a professor and I, I still, most of what I do is teaching people, now it's state legislators instead of college students. Um, but I think that uh, it is, some of these ideas, even though for us they seem really simple, right? Let people trade. I mean, I think that uh, a lot of Adam Smith's takeaways, even though the, the Wealth of Nations is not a particularly easy book to read, the messaging in there is pretty simple. Let people trade, let them be free to transact, and they will trade with one another. It's what helps create wealth in society. It's what makes people better off. Um, a lot of those ideas are really simple, but it's also very easy to craft short-term messaging on the other side of that equation. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll play an old card here, and I'll, I'll, I'll blame it partly on, on TikTok and Twitter, right? Like, if, if, you have to, if you have to summarize an entire argument in 240 characters, then um, you, you can't do a great job of really explaining uh, an argument or what's going on. But what you can do is you can point out a quick negative outcome, right? Like, uh, oh, there was this natural disaster, and now I had to pay... Uh, go to say something crazy, like $100 for a bag of ice. Like, this is crazy, this is wrong, we should fix it, you shouldn't be allowed to, to charge more. Well, like, what are you not seeing in that equation? How about, thank you for there being a bag of ice here, and the person in front of me didn't come and take it and sell out. Uh, I think uh, some of the early economic research, uh, I, I still remember I read that captivated me, uh, looked at natural disasters and said what happened afterwards, and you can see uh, how prices fluctuate. Uh, and the question was, you know, who wants to buy a bag of ice? Like, who really wants to buy a bag of ice, right? And then you go through the thought process. I'd, I'd love to go through this with my students, right? Who wants to spend $5 on a bag of ice? That's expensive. $10, $20? Well, think of the things that you're willing to cool for that much money, right? Uh, we know that one of the first things to sell out at grocery stores or at stores around the country when there's a natural disaster is beer. Beer is like the first thing to sell out. Check the Walmart data. I'm completely serious here, right? How much would you pay to cool your beer, right? A dollar bag of ice doesn't seem so bad, but a $20 bag of ice doesn't sound so great, right? So you probably won't pay $20, so you'll leave it there for the next person. 
Uh, but what we found out are uh, the people, the highest willingness to pay, the people with the highest demand to pay for a bag of ice uh, are people who need it for medicines, right? Specifically insulin, things that must be refrigerated or kept very cold, right? So a hundred dollar bag of ice could be life-saving for someone. Or if the bag of ice stayed at a dollar, it's all gone because people used it to keep their beer cold, right? That's a that story took me a couple minutes to tell, but I think it's a really sort of nice way to illustrate how prices work and how markets function. It's hard to do that in 30 seconds or in you know, 120, 240 characters, right? So uh, I, I think that there's a lot of work to do on the education front and then to keep coming back and uh, you know, I'll, I'll add one other thing to this. I, I think a particular weakness uh, maybe of ours in the economics profession is that we are, we tend to be very good with data and we tend to be less great storytellers. So uh, a storyteller with a passion for telling a specific story uh, can tell it regardless of how well done the economics are in that story. Uh, and I think some of our colleagues have illustrated that just in popular media lately, how uh, you don't even have to be true to history to tell a historical drama. Uh, you can just make up stories, make up facts and, show economics in whatever light you want because it's in the background. Uh -huh. The economist's got to get on TikTok. That's, uh... No, that, <laughs> I, if, if that was the takeaway, I no, told that story right. poorly. Um, no, but going off that point, I, I think I, I agree on like the, you know, some of it is kind of on our fault of like we, you know, we obviously don't do a good enough job of explaining it well to enough students as, you know, a lot of students take econ um, and, you know, we just got to do better of finding different ways, finding creative ways, um, finding, you know, maybe not necessarily like, oh, it's very easy to like, you know, look at supply and demand and write things of like, oh, well, you know, this $10 widget or whatever, but it doesn't really get across the broader point. Um, if you can make it, you know, related to like, oh, like one thing I use in classes, like, oh, like, you know, when you're thinking about competition versus monopoly, it's like, oh, well, you know, if you're trying to, you know, if you, if you want to date someone, you want to be the sole, you know, person going after that person, right? You want to be the only person who's interested. Um, you don't really want a lot of competition. Um, making it something that is interesting to their life, not just um, in a very like broad, like basic textbook sense. Making it something that's you know that they could take outside of the the world that isn't just oh well, you know okay well things get more expensive when demand goes up and cheaper when supply goes up and et cetera. Like what does it mean for them? Right. No, that all makes sense. I do think it's our fault, but uh, <laughs> some, yeah, just a little, just a little. Yeah. Well, yeah, we can pass. We can only do so much. Yeah, yeah. The, the profession, but yeah. not us, right? Yeah. Sure. Um, well, if there are no further questions, I think we'll adjourn to uh, reception out in the lobby. Thank you for coming out on this tornado day.